Okay, um, welcome, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Stefan Bergmann from Red Hat and this morning I'll talk about uh, how to write client plugins to have more fun and more profit with a code base. So I'm not sure if everybody in the audience even knows what Clang is, let alone a Clang plugin. So if there's anybody who does not know, I'll start it off more slowly. Um, anybody who already did write a Clang plugin? Half of it, great. Um, Bjorn asked me to, to uh, why not make a talk on this, but Bjorn's not yet in the audience. But uh, <laughs> meanwhile, he did write, or at least one, so he probably knows by now how to do that. Great. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start off with a little uh, example right out of our code base from a couple of weeks ago um, to, to uh, get a, a, a reason to actually do write some plugin. Um, this is some C++ code. Is anybody in the audience who does not know C++? Oh, uh, he's a technician. Uh, <laughs> Is the, is the uh, recording going on? I don't know. Okay, we don't know. Um, so yeah, this is um, some arcane kind of C++ code. It has a bug. Um, it is a destructor, as you all see, or not by the um, thing. And it tries to um, have some stream that it wants to reseek to the original position when it uh, goes out of scope, so that the stream that it is operating on uh, is back at its initial position. So what it does in this constructor is to seek back to the original position. If anything with the seeking goes wrong because your disk has disappeared or the network is down or whatever, um, it, it tries to catch whatever error because it doesn't want to throw out of the destructor because throwing out of destructors is, is, is very bad. Um, yeah, shame on the person who, who wrote that because as you all of course, C, this code has a bug. Um, it didn't use the normal try catch block, it used the function try catch block, um, which is directly written past the function declaration. The try falls off, there's no real code body. What this kind of construct does, for all those who don't know it yet and never seen it before, um, it this is all the stuff the destructor does, including destructing the sub-objects and the member variables. Um, and if anything of that throws an exception, exception, it, it goes into the catch block. So it'll catch this one as well, all the body stuff as well. But um, in that catch block, it uh, re-throws your exception. So it is different from this one, which will do the body catch the exception, then destruct all the base classes and member variables. Um, and this is what the guy wanted to write. And the other thing was what then actually um, read through the exception on a, on a, on a failure to, to seek back and then cause the program to abort. And uh, when I found that, I thought, hmm, that's one incident of this. Maybe we have more of those. Yeah, but. Uh, is there a way to grab for that? You can grab for try, can grab for catch, can grab for the tilde in the destructor, but uh, you won't find any of this with these simple techniques. So, Clang to the rescue. Um, with Clang, it's easy to um, pattern match or find things in the abstract syntax tree that is derived from this actual syntax that you saw there. So the compiler takes your text, your character-by-character character stuff, and transforms it into an abstract syntax tree that still represents the structure um, of your code, but not the nitty details, uh, what characters were written at what place, but it still uh, contains the essence. Um, so the idea is to write a plugin that just hits on these cases of using function try blocks um, within destructors. Um, 
this one was one with, a, with an empty handler, which is, is, is even more um, telling that this was a mistake. Um, but uh, all kinds of function try blocks on destructors are uh, kind of always bad because what you should actually do is not do this stuff in a, in a destructor in the first place. Um, so we've taken the easy <coughs> road and, and just find all of the uh, destructor try blocks in our little plan plugin that we are about to write in a moment. Um, so this talk was uh, presented as bring your own computer. I didn't know that it would only last uh, 30 minutes, um, so it's probably uh, not realistic to expect that you all pop out your laptops now and start typing. Um, but we do have a hackfest tonight, so if anybody of you by then is still interested in this stuff, um, we can. I'm, I'm glad to, to, to help anybody set up to, to actually do right your plugin of choice. So what you need um, to, to get this working is of course a, a clay compiler. Um, most of the time when you do um, develop for LibreOffice on, on Linux at least it will be the, the, the GCC that is from the from the distro. Um, so you need to, to, to set up some things on your machine to get a clang working. Uh, nowadays per distro it's mostly easy to, to just install clang. You have to install some additional uh, include files that you then link against that uh, export the functionality from, from, from the Clang nerds to your plugin. So you often need to install some additional packages. And then in, when you compile LibreOffice uh, in, the, in the autogen input, you just need to uh, set two variables that tell it to use uh, Clang instead of GCC. And in the non-debug builds, we don't build the plugins by default. Uh, so if you want to play it safe and do a non-debug build, um, which developers never do anyway, uh, you, you all, uh, explicitly also uh, enable the compiler plugins. Um, if you happen to build your own clan, which is also good because Trunk is moving fast, just as we in LibreOffice do, uh, and, and brings in new, new features all the time and, and sometimes new bugs, which you can then report to them, and they're happy. Uh, if you do build your own clan, you can enable assertions in the clan code that um, might be advantageous if you write in your plugin some code um, that is not actually working right, um, then there will be lots of asserts in the clan proper code that you then fire and then you, you learn earlier that your plugin doesn't work as it should be. Um, so, the basics of the plugin is just some CXX file that you drop into one directory in our code tree in the compiler plugins plan directory. There's already many of these beasts there, so you can take inspiration from looking at any of them. Um, and there's kind of a sort of boilerplate um, structure that all these plugins have. Uh, you uh, define one class for your plugin that needs to derive from two other classes from this recursive as visitor that I'll speak about in a moment and from our own plugin helper class uh, that Lubashons wrote that uh, does the, the, the plumbing stuff to get this plugin into the, the framework of all the plugins running when you when you then compile. So it needs a constructor to, to get some data from our plugin uh, instantiation stuff and then it needs a run uh, function that uh, starts off all the, all the stuff. Um, and this is some optimization already. Uh, it checks if this is actually a C++ compilation going on and not a C or Objective C one, uh, because these uh, function try blocks are C++ specific, so it wouldn't make any sense to run our plugin on, on C code. So we speed up the compilation a very tiny little bit by not running this needlessly on, on C code. So what that does is some magic then traverse decal which uh, is actually starting off this recursive ask visitor stuff. Um, and what the recursive ask visitor does is you have this syntax tree where every kind of structure in your program is represented by a node and you uh, just walk down this tree node by node <coughs> and for every different kind of node um, there's a different function that can get called 
Um, for example, if you have an expression, if you have A plus B in your code, then there will be a node for the plus expression, um, and it's of a certain expression class subtype. Um, so you have, a, for example, a visit binary plus expression thing, or uh, you have a visit call expression if you do a function call, or if you do a destructor call, or if you do a throw statement, there is a visit throw statement stuff, or a visit if statement, um, and also for all the declarations in the code. So if you call a function, um, the function that you actually call is declared somewhere. So there's a function decal, function declaration uh, node in your syntax tree. So all these <laughs> tiny little things get visited one by one. Um, and to learn about what kinds of, of visitors there actually are, what kinds of, of nodes there are that will get visited, um, the, the best uh, way is to look into the, the Clang uh, include files because they list all these, all, all of these nodes are different C++ class, represented as different C++ classes in the compiler um, innards and you can just uh, look into these header files to get an idea what kind of, what the names of these uh, classes are and what, what, what's available to, to actually visit. Um, they do differentiate between the, the proper C subset maybe and, and the um, stuff that is C++ specific. So some of the expressions, for example, are only in, in, in the uh, CXX uh, include files. So the throw statement, for example, would live in the statement CXX because the throw statement is specific to a C++. Now, yeah, many, many things we could visit, but what should we with it? Um, again, compiler to the rescue. Um, Clang has a nifty feature to not generate code when you ask it to compile, but to output this abstract syntax tree. And uh, it does that in a somewhat yeah, arcane manner, lots of detail, but among all this detail is the stuff that we're interested in. So you create a very simple C++ source file so that you don't get lost, just one line. What it does is a structure declaration uh, with a dis the definition of the destructor, uh, a structure with the definition of the destructor that does have this arcane uh, function try block. Um, and what falls out of asking Clang to ask it to dump the ask the extra syntax tree is some blah blah. And uh, then it's destructor decal, aha, uh -huh, that's this part here. Um, and directly underneath it, so it's only child in the tree, is the CXX try statement. Um, normally you would expect the function de definition to be followed by a compound statement that is um, the terminology for, for a block with curly quotes around it. So every function declaration only has a block following it. But in this special case, the block is this part that is hidden inside the try statement. So, uh huh, we know now we need to visit CXX try statement inside of, directly inside of CXX destructor decal. So because there's other try statements that are used for these normal try catch blocks everywhere in the code which we don't want to catch. So we first need to make sure um, we are inside a destructor decal. So we don't actually add a visitor on the CXX um, try statement, but we first um, introduce a visitor or, or write a visitor that will um, go into or that will fire, that will visit um, the destructor declaration. And uh, then there's again some boilerplate that you need to write into every visitor function that you write. Um, first thing is to, um, if this declaration is at a code location that is not interesting for us because it is from a, um, from a standard header, for example, and there's so much dirt in these standard headers, 
for better or worse, and, and we don't want to warn about any of that or, or look at, even look into any of that. Um, so we have some helper functions to find out this declaration is from where we don't want to look, and then we just bail out early. The other important thing, you always need to return true from these functions, because as soon as you return false from any of them, um, the whole traversal of the tree stops immediately, so the rest of the program is not even looked at. So that's an easy mistake to make, always return true in these villages. Um, so, next step is, um, these, uh, this, uh, app, uh, this uh, recursive ask visitor doesn't use um, virtual functions, that's for speed reasons. So it uses this uh, uh, curious uh, pattern where you pass in the class itself and what it does behind the scenes is a very, um, very fast way of dispatching on all these, on all your functions that you write. Um, the downside is if you if you make a mistake in the function name, then that will not be directly caught by the compiler. But what will happen is that your function just never gets called uh, if you if you use a name that that doesn't match anything. So a good idea is when you start to write a visitor um, to make it fire on every occurrence of that. And if you then run it over the code, um, then chances are that you do catch many of these because there's, for example, many destructor declarations in our code. And uh, if you get many warnings, then, then you know uh, how my function is working. If you get none, that's typically a sign that you've made a mistake uh, with a declaration of your visitor. So what we do, we just add for every destructor that we don't ignore, due to location, um, we report some warning, destructor found, we give it some information about the um, the location where it is, so if you run that live, um, And now, so for every occurrence of a destructor, it now yells, ah, destructor found, and, and gives you a nice carrot at the start of the destructor function name, and then some wiggly underline for all the, all the range. Um, there is this nice feature of um, that was the wrong key. There we go. That's the nice feature of, of giving a, one location that is the main location of the uh, source of, of the declaration you're interested in, and then passing in also the, the complete range of the declaration, so that tells this uh, reporting engine to, to, to annotate nicely your source code with this carrot and, and the wiggly lines. So that's a nice feature. Um, the GCC then copied eagerly to be part again. Um, so yeah, that's, now we know our plugin works rudimentary, and now we want to get it to actually do what we want it to do. Um, what was it? We wanted to find a CXX try statement directly nested inside a destructed decal. So we have the destructed decal, we now need to look into its body, so if this one doesn't have a body because it's only a declaration um, or because it's deleted, then we can bail out early as well. So we have this one line. But if it has a body, we can get its body. And uh, all these little things about what can you call on a destructed decal, like that it has these functions, does this declaration have a body and get body and whatnot, uh, you find all that in the Clang header files. Um, so that's the source to always go back to and, and read through these include files and find out what the features of all these 
uh, playing in terms of classes representing your nodes R. Uh, so the body needs to be one statement only, exactly either this try statement or a, a compound statement for the usual case. Um, another little detail is that uh, LLVM and Plane don't use the standard RITI and dynamic card stuff from C++ because it's too slow for them, uh, because they have many dynamic dispatch kind of things uh, going on. Um, so they have their own tech-based stuff that is much faster to just dispatch on an enum uh, like thing. And so you have not dynamic cast, but their doom cast. Um, so you take the body and check whether it is a try statement. Um, so if it is, the doom cast uh, gives you a non-null pointer, otherwise it will give you a null pointer. So if what comes out of there is not a null pointer, you know, uh -huh, I'm in a destructed decal directly underneath, there's this try statement. So yeah, this is the occurrence of this function uh, try block. So in this case, we yell. So we um, even improve this report a little bit by no longer reporting on the destructor itself, on the location of the destructor, but on the location of this uh, nested try statement, but still in all cases return true so that we don't um, prematurely stop working. Um, and yeah, to, to actually try it out, um, you need to reword that one fix because as it turned out in the end that was the one and only use of this <laughs> arcane feature in our code base. But there was one and that's always uh, I think that's always the case. Whatever odd plan plug in you think about to try and analyze code, yeah. turn to the LibreOffice code base, there's always at least one case <laughs> that you'll find with that to demonstrate that your plugin is working. So if you reword that fix and then it was in, in Rider Perfect, that case, that problem. So if you then remake Rider Perfect, that one will fire. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? No, no, you don't. That's, that's another very great... And Sorry, um, the, the question was um, for C and C++, all these macros, all this pre-processing going on, uh, is that lost uh, at, by the time you reach um, this uh, abstract syntax tree walking? And uh, it is in a sense, but it is also not in a sense. Um, so the, the syntax tree, of course, is unfolded. Uh, I'm not sure if there was anything more specific you wanted to ask, or else I'll... Can I recover the, the, the macros, uh, especially the QT uses macros which basically are empty, so signals is a macro, mm. and it, it, it uh, results in empty strings. Yeah, that's, um, that's the problem. So, um, what happens is that all the, the, the uh, macros, of course, get uh, unfolded for the syntax tree, but for every bit that falls out of these macros, every character um, that then goes into the, the, the characters that make, do make up the, the resulting syntax tree, um, Clang records where that character came from. So these locations that I showed that are used to, to um, beautify the reports, these do know <coughs> whether they come from a macro um, definition or a macro expansion where you pass something into a macro as an argument and, and all the way, and this one can then also be again uh, taken as a macro argument and, and stuff like that. Uh, so it can get very nested and, and very ugly. And, 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 um, but in the end, this information is always there for every character that actually does end up as some kind of node. If you have these marker only 
things, then yeah, it gets uh, it gets ugly. If you know where they are, you can match on the light. If you always have a marker um, after, say, the closing parenthesis of a, de of a definition, of a function definition, or after the closing uh, parenthesis of, of, the, uh, of the declaration, um, then you could match on that and then ask client to get you the characters that follow that in the source code. And uh, you might be able to get that, but that's very tricky. Um, tricky area um, but that's also because of I mean the, the, the language of the preprocess that doesn't make it easy to to regain that. I'm not sure if there's a better approach for these kinds of of things. Purely purely text or in source text oriented might be better approach there than, than going by the ask. Okay. Yesterday there was a mini HDMI to HDMI adapter that belonged to this nice building <laughs> that accidentally disappeared. So if you guys could check that you don't accidentally have something extra in your bag from yesterday, it would be nice because we really need to recover it.